and she was handing out uh, medals to um, people who had volunteered and they, um, they helped out with the bush fires, I think, or maybe it was the um, floods up in Queensland, um, which was disrupted by um, what got described as a violent and angry protest by a mob. Um, what was going on is um, there was this uh, a funny small little pokey restaurant in the parliamentary precinct in Canberra where they were having this awards ceremony. And it just happened to be the case that there was also right next to this um, is the site of the Aboriginal Tent Embassy. And there had been um, a 40th anniversary celebration going on at the Aboriginal Embassy, um, which was basically quite a joyous occasion, also a serious political uh, issue. It was there to make a point about um, the failure to um, the failure to <coughs> achieve um, land rights and justice for Aboriginal people despite um, a long struggle that had gone on. But it was also basically uh, an event of um, celebration of 40 years uh, of this um, site of uh, protests uh, having been maintained. Um, and in the course of it, it came to some people involved uh, tension that the Prime Minister was just next door. Uh, I won't tell you the whole story. Ended up being on a paper. Uh, but this man here is uh, Michael Anderson, who was one of the four original um, protesters who started the Aboriginal Embassy back in 1972. Um, what I do want to say is that the, 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 if ever there was a sort of uh, media construction of, of an event, um, this was it. It was um, the idea that there'd been a riot or something was just uh, quite, um, quite bizarre to see. Uh, and what was more, what it tells us more than um, what actually happened on the day is tells us a lot about the sort of political imaginary of the Australian state and society, I think, as it's reflected in the public sphere. And, and two things that particularly um, struck, uh, one thing that particularly struck me in, in the, the, the debate that went on in Australia after this um, so called riot um, was the way the terms of the debate. Um, we're just incredibly ignorant about what the Aboriginal Embassy was, what it stood up for, what its history was. And it was still very much caught within the terms of a kind of um, debate that had dominated politics in, in Australia in the 1990s about the politics of reconciliation. Um, so there was one really uh, sort of rhetorical column written by uh, a guy called Andrew Bolt, a hardline right wing columnist. Um, and he said, so this is what reconciliation looks like on Australia Day. After so many concessions over so many useless years, we've allowed a shambolic tent embassy to despoil public space for 40 years. The reconciliation movement must end. It's just too dangerous. Uh, and then on a sort of more uh, left liberal um, uh, opinion piece, Martin Flanagan wrote, 20 years ago, Australia Day was not the event that it is now. Um, it was ramped up during the culture wars of the Howard Hughes. Now, um, it's all like sound, um, you know, without having known the whole background of what I'm talking about, you might not be um, following so far, but what I, want to, what I want to point out here is that both of these comments reflect um, the extent to which the mainstream um, public debate in Australia is remote from the reality and concerns of Aboriginal people. And in particular, it betrays the extent to which the debate between the major political parties about reconciliation actually mar marginalised perspectives throughout the 1990s. And both of these columnists were still sort of caught in the terms of this debate that went on about reconciliation in the 1990s. So Bolt's, uh, Andrew Bolt, the right-wing columnist, suggests that the embassy goes hand in, hand in hand with the reconciliation movement. Whereas the fact of the matter is the embassy's always um, been very ambivalent towards the idea of reconciliation. It's fought for land rights, sovereignty and justice. And it's to some extent uh, either expressed an indifference to the reconciliation process or else uh, an open sort of critique and hostility towards it. So Bolt's suggestion that this is, this is where reconciliation leads is, is completely um, wrong. On the other hand, Flanagan suggested that um, Australia Day has become more contentious because of the Howard um, Conservative government during the 1990s. But this is equally ignorant. Um, Australia Day is, is on the, marks the arrival of the British to, to, to um, the continent. And it's always been deeply contentious to Aboriginal people. In fact, in 1938, there was a National Day of Mourning declared in Sydney. Uh, in 1972, on Australia Day, the Aboriginal Embassy was founded. In 1988, there was the biggest protest ever seen in Australia uh, against the bicentennial celebration of Australia Day. And indeed, in 1992, 20 years ago, that he refers to, uh, during the Labor government, uh, the Aboriginal Embassy protesters occupied Parliament House um, for a couple of days. 
Um, so I'm going to um, uh, I'm going to move now to, to the paper. I wanted to say something about this um, because this has all sort of happened since I wrote the paper before, and I wanted to give a bit of context. So um, this was the actual um, the, the, the rally that was occurring on the day, the, the gathering um, at the embassy, and as you can see, it's right in front of Old Parliament House in the parliamentary precinct. I've included this photograph because you notice people do the black power salute, um, which is actually, I think, adopted from the black power by Canada movement in, in uh, America. But it was adopted and adapted by an um, Aboriginal uh, movement that was emerging on Aboriginal struggle that was occurring in, in the late 60s and early 70s that really set a train at the beginning of the, um, or led to the, to the establishment of the embassy. So this is really crazy. One of the, again, one of the four um, men who um, uh, established the embassy, we'll see more from a moment, to the top's um, Dennis Walker. And this is Gary Foley, so this is the guy who I'm, I'm now, um, uh, had the, the pleasure of meeting last year and now uh, editing his book. He's, he's very involved in the uh, as an activist in Australia, but it's also now a uh, historian. Right. So, the question of the relation between constituent and constituted power goes to the heart of the issue of political legitimacy in a democratic society. If constituted power refers to the institutionalised authority of the officers of state, with whose authority are these officers instituted? In a democracy, ultimate authority rests with the people, the constituent power that the state represents. Yet if the people are the ultimate authors of the law, does this entail that a people must exist independently of the constitution through which it represents itself? Or is it only by virtue of a constitution, and hence its formal representation, that a people is able to recognise itself as a political subject in the first place? If the political stakes of this conceptual paradox are particularly acute, well, the political stakes of this conceptual paradox are particularly acute in colonial societies, which excluded First Nations from the constituent power that authorised their constitutions. Such states have only retroactively recognised Indigenous people as citizens as they've sought to overcome the irresolution at the heart of a constitutional order that's bounded by internal colonisation. In this context, the question emerges whether the original exclusion of First Nations from the constituent power of the people can be overcome imminently by drawing on the normative resources inherent within the constitutional order, or is a more fundamental rupture with the constituted order of the colonial state or post-colonial state required to reconfigure the identity of the political community? Uh, Paul and I uh, take up this question in the Australian context by examining the politics of reconciliation in relation to the assertion of Aboriginal sovereignty. So in the 1990s, Australia sought to redress its colonial origin by instituting a policy of reconciliation. The reconciliation processes are often criticised for demanding that the victims of state repression relinquish their legitimate claims to justice for the sake of national unity. In the absence of a constituent moment that would provide the foundation for a new regime, reconciliation processes in settler colonial societies are particularly vulnerable to this too. So this is Australia compared to South Africa is fundamentally different in that there was no um, transition to democracy as most other instances where reconciliation is talked about. So in Australia, critics claim that the formal reconciliation process was a further stage in the colonial project of assimilating the Aboriginal population into the colonising society. Um, and in this kind and those critics tend, often tend to be more um, academic critics, right? But Aboriginal people, many Aboriginal people continue to insist that their sovereignty was never ceded, and many of the Aboriginal people, not I'm saying all Aboriginal people, but the one, many of the people I spoke to, remain broadly indifferent to the reconciliation process. That's basically kind of white power politics. It's not addressing some of their fundamental concerns. Obviously, uh, but it's obviously it's a bit more ambivalent than that, you know, complex than this, obviously, because there were uh, Aboriginal people involved and engaged in the reconciliation process. I don't want to sort of just dismiss um, those people. But uh, in this context, I'm interested on this insistence of Aboriginal sovereignty and the particular claim that's made in this suit. And the insistence on Aboriginal sovereignty represents both an assertion of a right to self-determination and a refusal to recognise the legitimacy of the Australian state that's incorporated them as citizens, and or perhaps to recognise the terms in which they've been incorporated as citizens. So in the paper, we characterise um, the formal reconciliation process 
as an attempt to redress the legitimacy crisis of the Australian state from within the constituted order. In contrast, we treat the Aboriginal embassy protest in Canberra as a constituent act that contests the constituted order of the Australian state from without by demonstrating Aboriginal sovereignty. Understanding these two modes of constitutional politics in terms of the antagonistic relation between constituent and constituted power provides a basis for further thematising the reactionary politics of reconciliation. However, we also consider the limits of understanding the relation between constituent and constituted power in terms of a binary opposition between creation and reaction. And in this light, we discuss how the political effectiveness of the embassy depends on exploiting the ambiguous position of Aboriginal people as both inside and outside the constituted order, as citizens within and citizens without the political community presupposed by the constituted order. So the sort of political upshot of the paper is to say, well, look, in Australia, both commentators on the right and on the left presume that reconciliation was part of this kind of progressive kind of politics of the left. And what we want to do is sort of deflate that um, story a bit and show how, uh, through this analysis, sort of reveals the sense in which reconciliation was a kind of reaction to or reactionary politics uh, in relation to the Aboriginal struggle that the embassy invokes. So, um, since I'm speaking to an international audience, I have to give you some background on the <coughs> history of the embassy and its relation to the reconciliation process. So, the first part of the paper is a kind of um, short, very quick, with the stop tour of the history of the um, embassy and, and its relation to the reconciliation process. In the second part of the paper, we sort of try to thematise this and conceptualise it in terms of a relation between the constituent and constituted power, where we're associating the embassy with the constituent act and reconciliation with the kind of um, politics of the constituted order. And in the third section is where we try to complicate this analysis a bit to show that sort of presupposition and interrelation between the constituent and the constituted politics. So the first um, section, breaking with the colonial past. So in 1991, the Australian Labor government initiated a 10-year formal reconciliation process, and the primary remit for the Council for Aboriginal Reconciliation was to improve relationships between Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples and the wider Australian community through education. So its main remit is education. In 1994, a public inquiry was established independently of the reconciliation process to investigate the widespread practice of removing Aboriginal children of mixed descent from their families which occurred through most of the 20th century. By the time it published its report in 1996, though, a Conservative government was in, was in power. The Howard government questioned the validity of the report's findings, and in particular, it rejected the idea that the practice of child removal constituted an act of cultural genocide, and uh, it did, didn't implement its recommendations, um, and specifically it refused to uh, make a formal apology on behalf of the Australian state for the practice of removing so a, a polarising debate ensued within the mainstream media over the issue of the genocide that was perpetrated against Aboriginal people in Australia, and this became known as the History Wars. Howard's refusal to apologise mobilised significant popular support for reconciliation from non-Aboriginal people, and this included setting up organisations such as Australians for Native Title and Reconciliation. Okay, so, um, and this is the context for why a reconciliation appeared as this progressive politics, because it was uh, enacted and mobilised against the Conservative government of the day. So this, um, there were various um, things that occurred, like this um, famous image of a sky rider with sorry in the sky. So, um, there's also this kind of sea of hands that was um, planted by this organisation, Antar, in front of the uh, Parliament House in Australia. So when Labor returned to power in 2008, Prime Minister Peter Rudd pictured here, said sorry to the stolen generations in the first sitting of Parliament. Although the formal reconciliation process had come to an end in 2001, Rudd's apology appeared to many as the cramming achievement of the reconciliation process, which had been stalled by the Conservatives. The apology provided official recognition of, recognition of the devastating impact of the removal policies on individuals, families and communities. Yet Rudd also attributed a broader historic importance to his apology since he sought to enact a constituent moment in the nation's history that would establish a new beginning. This a term. He also said um, this was not simply an opportunity for sentimental reflection, 
uh, but he claimed it's one of those rare moments in which we might just be able to transform the way in which the nation thinks about itself. It's a self-conscious uh, self invocation of the rhetoric of the constituent um, power, the constituent moment. So the apology was broadly welcomed by Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people as a long overdue official recognition of the suffering that had been inflicted on them. However, many resisted the sense of resolution in rights rhetoric, insisting that unfinished business remains. And this unfinished business referred to the need for reparative measures such as compensation, which the government hadn't done anything about. Um, it also referred to the status of Aboriginal people within the constitution. In a speech given on the day of the apology, for instance, Pat Dodson, a former chairman of the Council for Aboriginal Reconciliation, pointed to the outstanding need to cement an honour and respected place for Indigenous people within our polity. So long as Aboriginal people were still unrecognised within the constitution, he said, the legitimacy of the country would remain compromised and the concept of terra nullius persists. So terra nullius is a legal doctrine that um, says that because the indigenous inhabitants weren't uh, making economic use of the land, therefore the crown would claim it. So in contrast to the culture war that was waged by conservatives, the reconciliation movement understood itself to be progressive. But this ignored the fact that the reconciliation, that reconciliation emerged in the first place as a reaction to a campaign for a treaty by Aboriginal people throughout the 1970s and the 1980s. It was a campaign that there was a need, was a need to make a treaty between because um, Aboriginal people's sovereignty had never been recognised. British never entered into any treaties uh, in Australia as they've done in, in other places. Um, therefore, it still needed to be made. Uh, the treaty was demanded as a way of sort of reconfiguring the terms of political association between Indigenous and non-Indigenous people. I should mention that there is, at the moment, there's a debate about um, constitutional change and a referendum to um, recognise Aboriginal um, people within the constitution and to remove the racist um, bits of the constitution that are still there. So against the impulse of the reconciliation movement to enact a moment of closure on the colonial past, the insistence on unfinished business by Aboriginal people highlights the continuing dynamics of colonisation in the present. Kevin Gilbert um, uh, provided a powerful statement of this at the beginning of the reconciliation process in 1992, deploring the turn in official policy from a treaty to reconciliation. And Gilbert had been very involved in the campaign for treaty. He said this, What are we to reconcile ourselves to? To a holocaust? To a massacre? To the removal of us from our land? From the taking of our land? The reconciliation process can achieve nothing because it does not promise justice. It does not promise a treaty and it does not promise reparation for the taking away of our lives, our lands and our economic and political base. Unless it can return to us these very vital things, what have we? A handshake? A symbolic dance? An exchange of leaves and feathers or something like that? For Gilbert and many others, the possibility of breaking with the colonial past depends on the recognition of Aboriginal sovereignty. The legitimacy of the Australian state rests on the presumption that there is no recognisable legal or political organisation on the continent prior to the arrival of the British Crown. Consequently, the insistence on Aboriginal sovereignty fundamentally contests the basis of the constituted order. It's the polar opposite of terra nullius. So for many people, the Aboriginal, um, the ten Aboriginal ten tendency that's camped on the lawns in front of Old Parliament is an important demonstration of the sovereignty that they've never ceded to the colonising state and society. Over the past four decades, the embassy has been erected and re-erected in response to attempts by the Australian state to defuse claims for Aboriginal rights. The original protest in 1972 united Aboriginal people around the demand for uniform national land rights. The 1960s had seen the development of a pan-Aboriginal political consciousness and the assertion of self-determination by taking control of organisations um, that were formerly dominated by um, non-Aboriginal people, such as the Federal Council for Aborigines and Torres Strait Islanders. While ownership of land has always been central to local struggles for justice by Aboriginal people since the time of colonisation, or the original um, the beginning of colonisation, the demand for uniform national land rights found a renewed national expression in, that was embodied in the Aboriginal members' protest. So the four uh, Aboriginal men who initiated the dem demonstration by planting a beach umbrella on the lawn in front of Parliament House uh, on the 20th, it's actually the 27th of January 1972, did this in protest against Prime Minister McMahon's rejection of land rights. McMahon was a conservative, a part of a conservative government that had been in power for, I think, 
at least 20 years. Um, now, McMahon instead, instead of giving land rights, which there's been this ongoing struggle for, he uh, instead endorsed a weak form of title that was called general purpose leases. And it was only made available to community, communities that were still living on their traditional land. Um, and, this, and, and these weak kind of form of basically leasing back the land to um, people whose land it was, um, would still ensure that the continued exploitation of the land by the mining and pastoral industry. So that was, um, uh, some of the things that uh, Roger were talking about um, were very much brought out in the same context. So since McMahon's um, statement effectively relegated Aboriginal people to the status of aliens in our own land, recalls Gary Foley, as aliens, he said, we had an embassy of our own. And Michael Anderson declared that the Aboriginal embassy would remain indefinitely. Here's Michael Anderson, the guy that's been pushed aside in that last minute. He said, we'll stay until the government listens to us. And in that year, the embassy protest swelled into one of the largest and most significant demonstrations in Australia's history. Significantly, the Aboriginal embassies maintained a continuous presence within the parliamentary triangle since it was re-erected on its 20th anniversary in protest against the Labor government's abandonment of the treaty in favour of the 10-year formal reconciliation process. And maintained, it was there between 72 and 92, um, that sort of intermittent there, it's been there continuously since 92. Although the 1972 demonstration had put land rights on the national agenda and had helped to remove the Conservative government, the protesters pointed out that little had changed for Aborigines in Australia in the intervening decades. Uh, the following day, um, this is in 1992, uh, so the day after the, uh, the re erection of the embassy in 1992. Uh, this is Kevin Gilbert, the guy who's um, quite I read from him before. Uh, the following day, around 60 Aboriginal people, together with non Aboriginal supporters, occupied the then or the now disused old Parliament House and they flew the Aboriginal flag from it. At a press conference in Kings Hall, Billy Craigie, um, that's Paul Coe, actually, Billy Craigie's um, got his back to the camera here. Um, Billy Craigie was one of the four men uh, in that photo I just showed you before, said that the embassy had transferred its operations to Old Parliament House. It would stay indefinitely until we can work out our own Aboriginal government and maybe fill up the rest of the building with elected members of our own Indigenous sovereign nation. On the 28th of January, Paul Coe, uh, who was pictured here, and was a central, also a central actor in the 72 post protest, presented the Minister for Aboriginal Affairs, Robert Tickner, with a declaration of Aboriginal sovereignty and demanded an internationally supervised treaty. Later that evening, the demonstrators withdrew from Old Parliament House to the embassy, leaving four people to be arrested and charged with trespass under the Public Order Act. The embassy activists hoped that the arrests would strengthen their sovereignty case in the High Court and in the International Court of Justice in The Hague, if necessary. So that's the first uh, giving you the broad overview. I just wonder if anyone wants to, if you have any comments or questions at this point before I go on to the next section. I think it's, um, the con it's the, the, this context is really important, I think, to understand. Um, this is the context that was precisely missing in the media coverage of this um, supposed riot that occurred at um, the beginning of the year. Okay, so this section is called the constituent power of the Aboriginal Embassy. What you see here is a map. Um, that's actually a plan by Walt Hurley and um, Griffin, who um, designed the capital. So it's through the canvas, kind of like Washington. It's built on a plan. It's very much inspired by the um, by Washington. Um, so you know, where are we? So this is Capitol Hill, where the new Parliament House was built in 1988, I think, to do the bicentennial. Here's the old Parliament House, which was the, where the original. Um, yeah, I've got that. Yeah. Um, but actually, it's, it's hard to look on this because the, what was built is slightly different from what was planned. But the main thing is to see here's the triangle. Okay. Uh, at the top of there is the uh, was eventually was built the War Memorial in Australia. Uh, the new Parliament House was built here. Old Parliament House. Aboriginal end is right here. That's not been on, obviously not on this map, which is odd, but it's never been on any official map produced in Canada. Okay. Um, um, here is an aerial um, shot, so you can see how yeah, it's more or less the same. So here's the old Parliament House. That's no, sorry, the new Parliament House. 
And where are we? Yeah, there's the old Parliament House Aboriginal Overseas in here. Here. Yeah. Uh, this is the um, this sort of long boulevard is the Anzac Parade where they have the um, annual Anzac March, which we'll be having next next week, I think, uh, which is commemorates the Australian involvement in the First World War. So, and yeah, at the end is the World War. Um, you realise why this, this is important. Isn't it? So yeah, again, here's another official map, conspicuous um, by its absence. The Aboriginal Embassy right here. This is where that sort of restaurant is within a rose garden. Scroll up to the side of the embassy. So the constituent power of the Aboriginal Embassy. The, the much debated general constitutional paradox is fundamentally a chicken or the egg problem. Which came first, the people or the law? This raises important questions about the relative priorities of constituent action and constitutional order. Jürgen Habermas purports to resolve the paradox by appealing to the co-originality of the constituent power and constituted power. In his view, there's no need to accord priority either to democratic will or to legal reason because they stand in a relation of mutuality. One is not possible without the other, but neither sets limits on the other. This resolution depends on adopting a dynamic understanding of the Constitution as a future-oriented source of norms rather than a backward-looking constraint of the present. As Habermas will go, the democratic paradox resolves itself over time as the democratic assembly progressively realises the imminent potential of the original constitutional settlement. From this perspective, political struggles are part of a self-correcting learning process in which the hitherto poorly satisfied conditions of constitutional legitimacy are gradually corrected through the inclusion of marginalised groups and the empowerment of the private classes. <coughs> the historical violence through which every polity is in fact constituted is redeemed over time by, by reference to the virtual consensus to which the constitutional order appeals through the law. So against this view, Antonio Negri characterises the relationship between the constituent and constitutive power as one of irreducible antagonism. In Negri's account, the distinction between constituent and constitutive power correlates to two antithetical modes of politics. And Negri identifies constituent power with democratic praxis, but he characterises the constituted power as fundamentally anti-democratic. Constituent power is inherently creative. It coincides with the experience of free action, which becomes public space, constituting a communicative relation, its own condition of possibility. Constituent power does not only produce legal norms, but also subjectivity and ethical community. And as such, constituent power exceeds its representation in institutional forms. Its creativity threatens the constitutive power and gives rise to efforts to contain it. So in this account, constitutive, the constitutive power is reactive and it cannot produce anything on its own. It can only change by reacting to the constituent power. Like the relation between capital and living labour, constitutive power is parasitic on the productivity of constituent power, which it captures and channels for its own ends. The Negri's analysis presents some conceptual difficulties, which I'm going to try and just uh, not mention for the moment. But for our present purpose, we want to accept the political rationale for insisting on fundamental antagonism between constituent and constituted power. But in terms of political analysis, it doesn't work. And the reason for this is that, um, in practice, uh, the co-original, the co-originality principle can become ideological. So, in the context of an actually um, existing democracy. I don't think it's necessarily ideological, but it can, can become so. And the reason is that it obscures the social struggle in which constituent power is enacted by subordinating it to the terms of representation that are available within the constituted order. So all conflict is all, always already internal to the unity that's presupposed by the constituted power. In practice, the doctrine of co-originality of constituent and constituted power um, means what I just said, social conflict is represented as internal to the political community or to the particular um, conception of the political unity that the state presumably presupposes. So in contrast, to view constituted power from the perspectives of these struggles is to recognise the political in the moment of antagonism in which the possibility of constituting the polity otherwise appears. Focusing on, on antagonism therefore enables us to recognise that social struggles not simply about conflict between particular interests or identities and their possible reconciliation. It also entails disagreement over the political, that is the common, or the, the, con the conception of the common, or the image of the common, in terms of which conflict is represented, mediated, and potentially resolved. So, um, in, in this section, we, 
we thematise the opposition between Aboriginal sovereignty and the politics of reconciliation in terms of an antagonism between constituent and constituted power. And we do this by um, contrasting these two sites um, within the parliamentary triangle, the Aboriginal Embassy and Reconciliation Place, which was constructed um, down here at the end of the formal reconciliation process. And we contrast them in terms of their spatial, temporal and subjective dimensions. And so we treat these both as kind of manifestations of a kind of broader um, politics, these two kinds of politics. So this, this part's divided into um, sort of three sections on the, the sort of spatial, the temporal, and the <coughs> social dimensions of the constituent, constituent power antagonism. So the first section is called the presence of the Aboriginal Embassy, which is about the spatial dimension. So constituted power codifies and polices territory, polices space through the prohibition of certain activities and movements, but it also renders action meaningful in specific ways. It determines, for instance, whether people are involved in a properly public activity, such as protesting, or a properly private one, such as camping. And this distinction between protesting and camping becomes really important in terms of the history of the embassy. What are they doing there? Are they protesting or are they camping? It's okay to protest for citizens, but you can't just come and camp in the middle of camp. Constituent power, in contrast, is a generative force that creates public places. It reorders the space of constituted power by reconfiguring what can be seen, done, and named within it. While constituted power is concerned with policing public space to regulate, codify, and sanction action, constituent power is concerned with producing public places in which people can participate in and articulate new forms of political community. And so what we say is that the reconciliation place actually exemplifies the constitutional ordering of space. It's located in the middle of the ceremonial precinct of the capital city, as I sort of showed, and it complements and reinforces the monumental landscape of the parliamentary triangle, whose axial lines connect the major institutional symbols of the Australian state. So I should have shown. So what it did is it connected a path between the National Library here. No, is this, this is the museum. National. <laughs> well, the National Library's over here. Maybe this is flipped around the wrong way. <laughs> Anyway, between the National Library and the National Portrait Gallery. Um, so it's built within this axis, but it's also built on that longer axis I showed going up towards the um, War Memorial. <coughs> and it is this sort of big, sort of monumental uh, architecture. Well, as one member of the Aboriginal uh, Embassy described, the sort of fascist architecture um, they see. Uh, uh, Walter Fairley Griffin was a Freemason, which you know, he tries to sort of conspiracy theories in Okay, so. Um, a reconciliation place is commissioned to acknowledge and commemorate the journey of reconciliation as a joint undertaking between Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australians. Um, and here's an image, this is like standing within um, the reconciliation place, just shows you how aligned with the axis it is. That's an aerial shot. So um, we were just looking from here back that way. And here's the path for one um, kind of horizontal. Okay, so um, the neoclassical structure of old parliament house is in the apex of the parliamentary triangle. And as you stand on the steps looking out towards the war memorial, which you can see in the background, um, uh, your, your line of vision is kind of interrupted by this, this uh, flag flying from a wooden um, pole. And the flag flags flown at the Aboriginal Embassy, which is a semi-permanent encampment comprised of a range of makeshift and constantly changing structures. And over time, these have included a shipping container, a demountable shed, an array of gunyas or traditional shelters, uh, this perpetual fire that uh, burns continuously, a collection of tents, a mural painting that's been made, and my favourite is the various native trees that have been covertly planted by activists over the years. And, um, see these trees were planted by some of the original activists. Um, and people remember who planted which tree as well. And their children, and this one woman I spoke to, came back, you know, was talking about the tree that her father had planted there. So, this pointedly anti monumental architecture demonstrates both the dispossession from and continued possession of Aboriginal land. On the one hand, it's reminiscent of Aboriginal camps on the outskirts of rural towns and the material conditions that many Aboriginal people continue to endure. But on the other hand, there's an assertion or reassertion of sovereign entitlement. It evokes a prior, prior order of occupation that preceded that which the colonial state seeks to monumentalise. 
In both modes, the embassy not only displaces the monumental order of its formal public sphere, it constitutes an alternative public space to that authorised by the state. It brings into being the subaltern counter public. Um, now, I should say, um, just skip through this, but the, the, um, the reconciliation place was partly the motivation behind constructing it was to get to remove the original embassy, because like, if you had reconciliation place, you don't need this embassy anymore. All right, let me talk about the event of the Aboriginal Embassy, the um, sort of temporal dimension. 